Great morning. Already been a great morning. Amen? Amen. How many of y'all enjoyed that worship? We could have probably just stayed right there, Pastor Lloyd. I think Pastor Lloyd was trying to. He's like, maybe we just stay right here. <laughs> but we got a, I got a good word for you this morning. Before I get into it, I just want to say Happy Father's Day to everyone. Amen? All the fathers in the house. If you're 18 years or older and you're a male, please make sure you get uh, one of the gifts that are outside the door there. Uh, and we just are so appreciative that you would be here at the church. What a, what a great job of getting to church on Father's Day, dads. Can you give your, your, yourselves a hand this morning? Yeah. It's not easy always getting to the house of God. And sometimes on Father's Day we think, well, what do I want to do on Father's Day? You know, this is my day. You know, I get to do whatever I want. And you chose church. So congratulations, you chose wisely. You know, parents are so important. Um, fathers are, I'm going to say, one of the most important things in people's lives. Uh, a good father, a godly father. You know, there's surveys that say that if a child uh, becomes a Christian first, you may have heard this, that there's a 3.5% probability that the rest of the, the family will get saved. Uh, if a mother is the first to become a Christian, then that goes all the way to 17%. Uh, likely that 17% uh, the, that the family will all get saved. However, if a father gets saved, that probability of the whole family getting saved goes up to 93%. Amen? So dads, you have a huge responsibility and it is a great calling to be a godly father. Amen? And I would say this morning that, you know, I just want to, before we get started, I want to pray over some people here because I know one of the things that the enemy has worked overtime on is to destroy the view of a good father. Because we relate to God as our father God. And so he, he wants to distort that view. And many of us have a distorted, perverted view of what a good father is. And we have a lot of father wounds and, and things that we carry with us. It is one of the reasons why when we sing a song like, uh, I trust in God, it's hard for some of us because we go, well, you know, I hadn't been able to really trust in anybody. You know, my father walked out on me or my father was an alcoholic or my father was abusive or my father was violent or my father didn't treat people right or didn't do the right things. And so because of that, we relate to God that way. And it's hard for us to trust God as a father God. And many of us, even when we sing that song, we say, you know, I, I sought the Lord and, and he heard him and he answered me. And I, and I heard this morning as we were in worship, some of you say, well, I sought the Lord and I don't think he heard me and he hasn't given me an answer yet. And that's why I'm having a hard time trusting him. I want to remind you of Jeremiah 29, 13 that says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. If you've been seeking God and you haven't gotten that answer to whatever it is that you're seeking Him for, I want to just tell you, keep seeking Him. Just because it hasn't been answered yet doesn't mean that God is not faithful. He is still faithful. Amen? And maybe just because you haven't had a good view of what a good father is doesn't mean that God's not a good father. He's the best father. Amen? He's exactly what you need. He's exactly what I need. And so I just want you to close your eyes, and, and we're just going to pray right now for those of you that may be in here this morning, and Father's Day might not be easy for you for whatever reason. But Father, we just pray over each person here today, God. Lord, wherever they're coming from, whether, whether they had good fathers or bad fathers, maybe absentee fathers, Lord, you know every person here. I just pray, Lord, that, that as we continue in this service, Lord, that you do, Holy Spirit, what only you can do, and you just begin to pour in that healing oil in their life and just begin to heal those areas God some some things are so covered up we don't even know they're there but God you can expose them in such a way Lord that causes us just to want to love you more Lord not in a judgmental condescending or uh, like we missed it kind of way but God just you love us so much and you want the best for us so father the best father I just ask that you just wrap your arms around each one today Give that hug, that love that only you can give today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm excited about the word today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be stepping on some people's toes, but in a good way. Uh, I love you. Y'all can just say I love you too. Okay. <laughs> 
But, you know, like, I, I, I thought about this this morning, and I was like, you know what? The dads always get beat up on Father's Day. <laughs> but you know what? You're tough enough. You can handle this, okay? <laughs> you get beat up every day. I mean, we're guys. I mean, that's what we do. We, we just keep on going. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not going to beat you up in a bad way. I'm, I, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share with you the truth. Amen. Amen. How many need to know the truth? The whole truth. Nothing but, Nothing but the truth. Amen. <laughs> Because here's the thing, truth is transformational. When you really get a hold of a truth nugget, it'll change your life. You know, we can patty cake around and we can do all kinds of, you know, we can play church if we want to. Hank, we can play church, but playing church ain't going to get you anywhere. You know, what we need is the truth of the Holy Spirit this morning. And what, I, what I've titled the message today is all or nothing. Because I believe that's the way guys are wired. All or Nothing. Like, I'm going to be either all in, or I don't want to have anything to do with it. You know, like, if we're going to run, we're going to run. You know what I'm saying? Run 40 miles a day if we got to. If we're going to fish, we're going to fish. We're going to have every lure. We're going to have every rod. We're going to have it all. We're, we're going to prepare days ahead of time so that we can catch those fish. If we're going to golf, we're going to have the best golf clubs. We're going to go to the best places. We're going to get a coach. Nah, that's weak. We're going to teach ourselves because we're guys and we don't need coaches. <laughs> <laughs> whatever it is we we do it with all of our heart and I believe that's why a lot of times when it comes to church when it comes to being a believer there's a lot of men that kind of on the outside looking in like oh, I'm not sure if I'm ready to fully commit to that all or nothing but you know God is an all or nothing God he said this I'd I want you to be hot or cold what does he say I want you to be all in or just stay out what I don't want is for you to be coming in here every week saying that you're a believer, maybe to appease yourself or to appease your family or, or to make yourself feel better for a few minutes. But during the week, you know, you, 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 you're not all in. The rest of the time, you're not all in. You're just all in one time a week or two times a week. No, he's saying, listen, I, I, it's all or nothing. I'm looking for some men of God who will stand up, some women of God who will stand up a church of God that will stand up and say, we are all in with Jesus. Yes. See, that's, that's literally uh, spits in the face of culture right now. We have a culture that says you don't have to fully commit to anything. You can be whatever you want, whenever you want. I don't believe that. I believe you've got to fully commit yourself to God. You've got to fully commit yourself to His ways. Your heart has to be fully committed to God. If it's not, you're not going to really reap the full benefits of being a believer. See, Matthew 16, 24, I know you've heard this, but Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to come after me, if that's their desire, he said, they got to deny themselves. They got to take up their cross and they're going to have to follow me. This is not a weak complacent, timid, reserved kind of life or lifestyle that we call being a believer. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not a call of convenience. I'm just telling you this morning. If you want a call of convenience, this is, if you want to do it the right way, it's not convenient. In fact, it's very inconvenient. If I'm just being honest, God didn't call me to a life of, of, of leisure and, and complacency. He called me to a life of being devoted, dedicated, all in. Am I speaking the truth this morning? It's an all or nothing call. There's not two masters. There's not three masters. There's not two ways. There's not two lifestyles. There's not two truths. It's one way, one truth, one life. Amen? That's all there is to it. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 says it like this. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with a portion of your heart. 10% of your heart. 60% of your heart. 99% of your heart. I said, you love the Lord with all of your heart. He said, I want you to love God with all your soul. All your mind, all your will, all your emotions, everything about you, everything that is you, that makes up you, I'm giving it all to God. How reserved have we been? 
And, and when I'm preaching this morning, can you just understand that I can't even see your faces because there's this huge mirror right in front of mine? So all I'm seeing as I'm speaking to you is me. So don't think that I'm standing up here going, I got it figured out, guys. No, I'm saying the Lord is speaking to me that I want to purify my bride and I'm ready for righteousness and holiness to prevail. And I want some cleansing in my church. And he's saying, I want to start with you, Pastor Barry. That's what he's saying to me. Because we talk about the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Last week we talked about uh, the Holy Spirit will fill you up and empower you to live this this life. And you can do signs and wonders and miracles. But how about just living a godly lifestyle? Amen. How about just being the church that God called us to be in Acts chapter 2? Yeah. How about not just stopping with the infilling of the Holy Spirit, but going on to the end of chapter 2 and understanding Amen. that the early church doesn't look anything like the church that we sit in today. Hallelujah. Yeah. That we somewhere along the line got it twisted and confused and contorted. And, and it's not the same church that he called us to in the beginning. But if we want to see signs and wonders and miracles. And we want to see as the disciples saw the world turned upside down for his glory. Then we got to get back to the things that they did in the beginning. Amen. What did they do? It says all the believers. Everybody say all. all. Devoted themselves to the apostles teaching. And to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. There was a deep sense of awe that came over them all. The apostles performed many miracles, signs and wonders. And all the believers, everybody say all, all. met together in one place and shared everything they had. You want, to see, you want to hear some radical lifestyles? Right here it says they sold their property and their possessions and they shared the money with those in need. Oops, what? Do we want to be like Jesus? Do we want to be his bride? Do we want to be his church? See, I heard it said this week, and it's so true. It said, people are not uh, tired of Christians. They just are tired of hypocrisy. They hadn't seen any real Christians. So they're not tired of Christianity. They just hadn't seen any real Christians that actually look like Jesus. Hmm. I love you. And all the believers met together. They shared. They sold. And then it says this. They worship together in the temple each day. We get that one right one day out of the week. Two days out of the week. They met every day. And worshiped together in the temple. With great joy and generosity, they shared meals with one another. They would have the Lord's Supper together. All while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord saved and added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Praise the Lord. They were devoted to what? They were devoted to the Word of God. How devout are you? How devoted are you to the Scriptures? That's a big one. Because how are you going to know what God is calling you to do if you don't study to show yourself approved unto Him? We have whole denominations right now that are, that are incorrectly dividing the word of truth and it's splitting them right down the middle because they say, well, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the scripture really means. And that's archaic and that's old and that's antiquated and that's not for today. And God would never say that. No, listen, the word of God is true. It stands forever. It's unchanging. Amen? We got whole denominations, though, that right now are splitting in two because they are discerning the word of scripture differently. And in large part, they are allowing sin to come into the church. Can I say it more clearly than that? Because why? Because the word of God is not preeminent. The word of God is not, they're not studying it correctly. Look, if we want to know what we're supposed to do, if, we're gonna, if we want to know how to love each other, if we want to know how to live godly lives, then the word of God has got to be a priority in our lives. Amen? Amen? Fellowship was, was a priority to them. They devoted themselves to fellowship. What does that mean? Well, in, in our society, it's like, well, we get together and we fellowship. You know, we have some pizza, we have some, we have some games and cupcakes, and we have some coffee, and we, we're fellowshipping. It's a little deeper than that. It comes from the word koinonia, which means sharing in unity. It means having a common union. It means contributory help. Not, not, not just, can I, can I say this with all love and tenderness and grace and humility? Come on. It doesn't mean just coming and sitting in a pew. Yeah, yeah. 
it means doing something for Jesus. Not for the church. You're not blessing the church. You're, you're doing it as unto him. Amen? Contributory help. It means the brotherhood. Guys, I love this, the brotherhood, because I can get with that, you know? Like, we're not just here. We can call it sisterhood, too. But in this case, it's talking about the brotherhood. There's a scripture that I love. If I were to get a tattoo, it might be this one. 1 Peter 2.17. Because it's so like, it's just such a man scripture. There's not a lot of words. <laughs> There's not, I mean, it's just to the point. It says, honor all people, period. You. It says, love the brotherhood, period. That's right. It says, fear God, period. And then honor the king, period. Man, if we could just do that, we'd be living a good life right there. But there's a brotherhood, there's a fellowship that they devoted themselves to. We got to be devoted to that common union that we have with other believers. Amen? Amen. We got to stop having divisions among the churches and understand, come on, we got to understand that we're all going the same direction. That we're all sharing Jesus with people. That our goal is all the same, to get people out of hell and into heaven. To see transformation happen in people's lives. Amen? To put our stamp on the next generation and not let the devil put his stamp on it. Amen? Amen. To fight and strain so that we can get the baton into the hands of the next generation. Amen. Even though the enemy would try and come swat it out of our hands. Amen. No, our job is to turn to the next generation and make sure that the gospel is firmly stamped upon their foreheads. Amen? Amen. Come on. They did some other things too. They shared everything. They sold their property and their possessions and they shared their money with the needy. Sounds like community outreach. They worshiped together in the temple. Sounds like Sunday mornings. They met in homes. Sounds like small groups. They shared communion. Sounds like they remember what Jesus is doing for them. Amen. What he did for them. You may have heard the heartwarming story of Ananias and Sapphira. Anybody heard that lovely story in the New Testament, not the Old Testament? Now, God was real mean in the Old Testament, but then in the New Testament, no, God is still a God of justice. So today, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, amen? But in that scripture, in that passage, that, that was the early church, and, and everybody was selling their possessions and bringing their possessions together for the whole, the good of the whole. And Ananias and Sapphira had done that, but when it come time for them to bring the, the proceeds from, from the sale, they said, well, we're going to hold something back. Sounds like to me they were saying, we're, we're not all in. We're just kind of in. And, and I think the reason why they uh, suffered such a destructive end is because, not necessarily just because they lied to the Holy Spirit, although that is, that is important. I think it's because there was, if you look at it a little deeper, it's a warning against hypocrisy. It, it's a warning against a lack of integrity. It's a warning against acting one way and saying another thing. You know, integrity is doing the right thing even when nobody's watching. That's what character is. We, we lack that in the church. I'm not talking about in the pews. I'm talking about from the top down. We lack integrity. Where we're living a godly lifestyle. I believe God is cleansing and purifying His church right now. Amen? And I would say this. Don't confuse God's grace with God's approval. Just because you may not have been judged yet, just because something bad hasn't happened yet, and you may think, well, I'm getting away with it. No, listen, don't confuse God's grace for his consent. That doesn't mean that he's turned his head and he's not looking at it. No, what he's saying today is it's time to get it right. I'm, I am gracious. I'm giving you a chance to get it right. Amen? He's a God of justice. Listen, we have to, as believers, remove the middle ground of complacency. We got to get rid of that. It's a false sense of security. If we want to see God move, do you want to see God move? Yeah. If we want to see God move in our families, if we want to see God move in our community, if we want to see God move in our personal lives, then we have to make the decision today to go all in with Jesus. Amen? Amen. This is a decision that has to be made in the deepest part of your being. Nobody can make this decision for you, and you can fool a lot of people. Just remember, like what Peter said to Ananias and Sapphira, you're not lying to men, you're lying to God. 
We have to fully commit, fully surrender, fully die to ourselves, fully pick up our cross, and fully follow Him. Amen? 1 Corinthians 10.21 is a, is a warning that I want to say to myself and to everyone in the church, not just this church, but the church as a whole, the church global. It says this, you cannot dine at the Lord's table and dine at the table of demons. That's Scripture. You can't come in on a Sunday morning and have have dinner and, and dine and, and enjoy the, the pleasures and the delicacies of God and then throughout the week dine at tables of demons. And many of us by our lifestyles, we come in on a Sunday morning and we look real pretty, but if you were to see us on Monday through Friday, you would see that we have a lot of mixture in our lives. That we have a lot of, uh, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And it's spoiling the whole loaf. I'm telling you because it's not, number one, you're not getting the full benefits of being a believer. But number two, the world is not seeing the full benefits of you being a believer. Amen? The world needs to see a true Jesus on the inside of you shining out. Not a Sunday Jesus, not a Wednesday Jesus, but this is my life. This is who I am. I'm fully surrendered. This is my character. Whether you're watching me or not, whether you cut me off in traffic or not, whether you steal something from me or not, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to turn into a demon. I have got Jesus living on the inside of me, so I'm going to give you Jesus all the time. Jesus in the morning. Jesus at the noontime. Y'all know it. See, because this is where I'm getting to. The Lord led me to this a few weeks ago and, and was very stern with me on this right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, through, I don't know why they did the break at the end of 6, but seven, chapter 7, verse 1 should have been a continuation of it. This is what Paul says to the church at Corinth. He says, Dear, dear Corinthians, I cannot tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide open, spacious life. See, many people, when they talk about the life of a believer, it doesn't feel wide open and spacious. It's like, well, if I become a believer, then I got to quit doing all the things I love doing. And I got to be in this restricted straitjacket, and I, you know, I got to act right, and I got to, I can't do anything wrong, and I can't, you know, I kind of like sinning. I like that stuff. But see, you're viewing it wrong. You're, you're, you're not viewing it as a wide open, spacious life. It says, we didn't fence you in. The smallness that you're feeling comes from within you. And I'll show you why in just a second. But there's something on the inside of you that hasn't been settled, that hasn't been worked out. And so you've got this tug of war going on the inside of you, and it makes you feel like you're unsettled. Because the Bible says that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. So you're experiencing an instability in your life, and you're like, I don't understand why I, was, I'm, I call myself a believer, but I feel this tug of war always with the, the world and, and, and the church and God. And it's because you hadn't settled some things. What you're feeling is something on the inside of you that needs to be settled. Your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. I am speaking... <laughs> And this is the way I feel this morning. I'm speaking as plainly as I can and with great affection. Saying, I'm telling you the truth, but I love you. Open up your lives and live openly and expansively. And then he goes on to show us this juxtaposition, this, this literally litany of different things, literally different ends of the spectrum that he's about to show us that, that, that should be a very clear uh, uh, outline of how our lives should look. He said, if you want to live a wide open, spacious life, he says this, don't become partners with those who reject God. How can you make a partnership out of right and wrong? That's not partnership, that's war. Is light best friends with darkness? That word that it used there is a fellowship. Do they fellowship together? That same word, koinonia. Do they have any common unity? Do they have any common purpose? Is there any common calling? Between light and darkness. And, and you know the answer. There's not. He says, does Christ go strolling with the devil? Do trust and mistrust hold hands? Who would think of setting up pagan idols in God's holy temple? But that is exactly what we are. Each of us is a temple in whom God lives. We talked about last week how God comes on the inside of us. The Holy Spirit fills us. That when Jesus left and he said, I'm going to leave one better with you, better than me with you. And it's the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that the words that are used here, fellowship, communion, accord, part, agreement, he's saying these things don't, which one of these is not like the other? 
These things don't go together. In fact, one of them, when it says, what, what, uh, accord, what accord has Satan, or Belial in one version, and God, the word that's used there is symphonio. Symphony, the word we get symphony from. I find it interesting that a symphony is when you put four different parts together and they create a harmony. It's almost like the Father, the Son, Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and us. When we get together in a perfect harmony, we make a beautiful sound. But when we are speaking or trying to sing two different songs at the same time, it is nasty and ugly. And I think that's the sound that's going out more more often than not out of the church is this mixture of two different symphonies playing at the same time. Sometimes we get on key with God. We get in harmony with God. Other times we're on key with the devil and we're in harmony with the devil. I know. They're looking at you right now. They didn't say nothing, but I hope they got it. All right. I said, I have a moment with myself up here. <laughs> See, listen. It's saying this, we are temples. You and I are temples of God. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. And he said, what business, what partnership, what communion has God's temple, which is us, with idols? He said, well, I don't have any idols. We all have idols. Things that we elevate, things that we put above God, things that, that we sometimes not even knowingly know that we worship. I mean, you can make an idol out of so many things. You can make an idol out of money. You can make an idol out of your marriage. You can make an idol out of your children. You can make an idol out of your career. You can make an idol out of your iPad or your device. Are you checking in with God as much as you're checking in with your phone or Facebook or social media or Instagram or Snapchat anything that you put above God it's it we got to do a check on this stuff guys because it can get real out of whack real fast and we don't even but what business how much better would our lives be without social media there was a time we didn't have it <laughs> this is what he says he said I will live in them and I'll move into them I'll be their God and they'll be my people but then he gives us this he says but come out from among them come out from the midst of them and separate yourself separate yourself what does that mean that means to mark off a boundary line. There needs to be some boundaries in your life that you say, you know what, as far as I go and as far as me and my wife go and as far as me and my children go, there's some pretty clear lines that we don't cross. I mean, it's not that hard. I mean, in our family, we don't watch R-rated movies. And it's almost to the PG-13 area. I'm serious. And you say, well, I'm mature enough. I have people that have told me, well, I'm, a, I'm mature enough and I can watch that. And me and my husband, we're good with that. No, listen, you have, you have gone over the boundary line and you are putting filth in your life that is not from God and then expecting him to bless you. Oh, Jesus, help us. Uh, can you hand me my Bible? I meant to bring this up here. Turn over to Deuteronomy 22 because I, I, this, is, this is so cool. Uh, I know this is Old Covenant and Old Testament, but just, just look at this in chapter 22, verse 8. It says, when you build a new house, okay, did, did God build a new house in you? Did God do something? Did he create a new creation? So he said, when you build a new house, then you shall make a parapet for your roof. Well, what is a parapet? It's a, it's a little wall around the perimeter, a boundary so people don't get hurt. So when, when God does something in you, when he creates something new, you need to put some boundaries around your life that you don't cross over so that you won't get hurt and other people around you won't get hurt. That you may not bring guilt of bloodshed on your household if anyone falls from it. I know this isn't a physical sense, but think about this spiritually. Verse 9 says, You shall not, not sow your vineyard with different kinds of seed lest the yield of the seed which you have sown and the fruit of your vineyard be defiled. 
What's he talking to us about? I, I believe in today's sense he's saying, don't be, don't be perverting and, and mixing all these things that aren't supposed to be. You're going to get a defiled fruit. You're going to get something that doesn't look totally like Jesus. Amen? Then he says this, you shall not, not plow with an ox and a donkey together. Some of you are hooked up to a donkey. Some of you are trying to get some stuff done and you got, you got this stubborn thing. You, look, you can't. These two don't go together. It's like oil and water. We, we've got to get rid of the perversions. We've got to get rid of the, of the defilements. We've got to get rid of the, the dirtiness of our life so that we can get all of God that's supposed to be in our life. Amen? It's all or nothing. It says this, so leave the corruption and the compromise. Leave it for good. That's a decision, says God. Don't link up with those who will pollute you. We have a lot of uh, environmental activists today that are really worried about the environment and global warming and all that stuff. I'm not, I'm not going to get on that subject because I, I, to me it's all going to end up the way God wants it to. He, I'm in his hands. But what I will say is this, if you want to be an environmental activist, why don't you be an environmental activist about the ecosystem of your own house? What pollutants are in your house? What things are causing you to overheat? What things are causing you to be uh, uh, distorted and perverted? What are those things in your life? What, what is God talking to you about? Amen? He says, don't link up with those who will pollute you. And then he says this, I want you all for myself. It's God said that. I want you all for myself. I don't want just want a part of you. I want all of you. Did you know that God is a jealous God? He's jealous. He's jealous that, that he doesn't have your whole heart. He's jealous that he doesn't have your time. He's, he's jealous that you've got your, yourself spread so thin that, that he can't even speak to you. He's jealous that, that you listen to other voices more loudly than his voice. He's jealous that, that people on TV get more of your time than he does. He's jealous. You say that? God's jealous? Yeah, it tells us. In Exodus 25, God is a jealous God. But I want to end with something good today. Because he says this, if you will separate yourself, which by the way, separation, it comes from that word sanctification, which means to be set apart for God's purposes. He said, if you will separate yourself unto me, get rid of the mixture, get rid of the complacency, the middle ground. He said this, I will receive you unto myself. What does that mean? I'll receive you unto myself. Well, in Scripture, there's over 780,000 words in the King James Version. And out of 780,000 words, this is the only time this word is used. This word for receive. I'm not going to attempt to say it because it's, it's not English. <laughs> but what it means is this. I'm going to receive you in a personal, in a heartfelt way into my favor. What's that mean? If you will do this, then you're going to get my favor. I don't know about you, but I could use more of God's favor in my life. How about you? Could you use more of God's favor? Listen, an example of favor would be grace, which everybody, when we receive Jesus, we get unmerited favor. We didn't do anything to earn it. God just gave it to us. And that's what favor is. It, 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 he said, if you'll separate yourself to me, he said, I'll make things happen in your life that you could never dream would happen. I'll bring you to places. I'll take you in front of people. He said, I'll put you before kings. I, I'll promote you. Because why? Because if I promote you, I'm promoting me. Because Christ in you is the hope of glory. So if you're dedicated to me, then when I put you in front of people of influence, you're going to tell them about me. So he said, I'm going to give all my favor to you. Amen. Psalms 84.11 says, The Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Mm. That's a great promise, isn't it? That you get the favor of God if you'll just separate yourself unto him. He also says this, though. He said, I'll be a father to you. 
on Father's Day. A lot of us don't know how to be a good father because we didn't have a good father. We really don't understand a father, the father heart of God. And there's so many things. I could preach a whole message on the father heart of God. So many good things that happen from the father heart of God. There's also one that's probably misunderstood that needs to be put back into the church. And it's a, that a, a good father disciplines his children. See, we live in a culture right now where there's a lack of discipline. Discipline has been, you know, labeled as something that's, that's bad or negative. But let me tell you something. If you love somebody, you'll discipline them. When you see something that's wrong in their life, instead of letting them just keep on going down that way, just going off the cliff and into certain destruction, you'll say, no, that's, that's going to hurt you. I'm going to bring discipline into your life so that you won't go down that way. A good father will do that, and a good father will bring discipline into your life. Amen. See, right now in culture, we have a lot of people <clears throat> that say, nobody can tell me what to do. Nobody can tell me what's right or wrong. Nobody has the ability to speak truth into my life. Truth is subjective. It's whatever I think is, is true is true. No, we need some people that are full of God, full of the love of God. We need some fathers in this generation. This is a fatherless generation. And if we don't step in as the church, I'm speaking clearly right now. If we, if we don't step in as the church, first be fathered by God. Secondly, learn how to father the next generation, then we will lose a generation. The enemy, I've never seen it before like this, but the enemy is after our children. Like never before. There is nothing more impressionable than a young child's mind. It's like wet cement. And if we are not making an impression on the next generation, then somebody will. We have to step up and father the next generation. Amen? Amen? He said, I'll be a father to you. And you get the benefits of being received. You get the benefits of love. You get the benefits of blessing. But you also get the benefits of being disciplined. And then he says this. This is the word of the master God. But chapter 7, with promises like this to pull us on, dear friends, let's make a clean break with everything that defiles or distracts us. That's the call this morning. God is calling us into holiness and righteous, righteousness. We don't speak about it enough in the church. Holiness and righteousness. He said, let's, let's make a clean break with everything that defiles or distracts us, both within and without. Let's make our entire lives fit and holy. Temples for the worship of God. Amen? Will you stand with me? I want our prayer team to go ahead and make their way to the front. I just want you to close your eyes this morning. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit just a simple question right there between you and God. Just say, Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me? What are you saying to me right now? I've heard all these words, but what personally are you speaking to me? If it's anything like what he's been speaking to me, he's saying, listen, I, need, I want you to clean up some things in your life. I want you to repent of some things. I want you to turn away from some things. I want you to turn some things off. I want you to tune me in. I want you to love the things that I love. I want you to hate the things that I hate. I want you to surrender fully to me. Somebody needs to hear, I want you to stop playing it safe. You've played it safe for a long time. Because it really doesn't matter what everybody else thinks about you. It's really just between you and God. And only you can answer the question, have I been giving God my 100% very best does he have all my heart? Does he have all my soul? Does he have all my mind? Father, today we're standing in your presence. 
Lord, when we get in your presence, Lord, we just feel so undone because you're so holy and you're so righteous. And Lord, we know all the things in our lives. Every one of us do. The playlist that we know you're asking us to surrender in this area and in this thing. God, today we come before you and first of all, we repent. We repent for the areas in our life where we've been selfish, self-sustaining, prideful, angry, controlling. Lord, we repent of those and Lord, we just say, please forgive us. We want to be pleasing to you. We want to live lives that are pleasing to you, Father. And Lord, today we just commit. This is a fresh commitment, a new commitment. Lord, you give us moments like this where we can make fresh commitments and choices. And Lord, today our choice is you and you alone. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would empower us by the Holy Spirit, God, to to make tough decisions, to have tough conversations, even if needed. God, to to pull the plug on some things. Lord, whatever it is, it's not your will for our life. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would just help us to be fully committed, fully devoted followers of you. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I, I pray right now over every person in here, God, especially the fathers. Lord, it's an amazing, awesome, scary calling to be a dad. But Lord, I just pray right now, Lord, that courage, just a courageous heart would be in each man in here today, God. Lord, that they would be that man that that stands in front of their families and they say, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, these are the boundaries. These are the areas. Lord, that we would be the the kind of men that are devoted to your word, the kind of men, Lord, that are devoted uh, uh, to to your your family, God, devoted uh, to fellowship, God, to staying in community, Father. Lord, that we would be all in kind of believers. Lord, I thank you for your empowering. Lord, we give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, I bless you on Father's Day. Amen. If you need any prayer, our prayer team's up here at the front. Love you guys.